Let me now introduce our, our moderator for the next panel, Market Manipulation. And it's a great privilege and pleasure because Bill Massey has been a friend and colleague for many, many years. Some, not as many years as some of you in the room, but, uh, but for quite a long time. Um, he is senior counsel now out of Covington's, uh, Was Covington and Burling, Washington's office. Um, you know, most people have a bio on their website that I think is a little bit of an exaggeration, but I I'm going to read some of Bill's, which I almost never do because I think it's not an exaggeration. It says he has a high-profile, broad-based energy regulatory and government affairs practice, um, which I think is, is true. It says he advises clients on, and then there's this really long list of things that he advises clients on. I'll summarize by saying he advises clients on everything, um, and appropriately so, because he knows the uh, energy markets as well as anybody in Washington. He, he served 10 years uh, as a commissioner at the FERC, including during the California crisis, the full term of the crisis. Uh, also, for almost a decade as chief counsel to U.S. Senator Dale Bumpers. I, I understand John Mayo was also involved in that. We'll be interested to hear John's thoughts in just a few minutes. Um, uh, he also likes to remind us that he served as chairman of the commission for two and a half hours, was it? Three days, day, excuse me, three days. Uh, in between the departure of one chairman and the, the uh, emergence of another. Um, he's recognized by the Chambers and Chambers Global, Best Lawyers in America, Legal 500 U.S. for Energy, as a Washington, D.C. super lawyer. He's certainly a super lawyer on my list. Uh, Bill Massey, thank you. Well, that is uh, such a kind introduction. I'm glad to be here today. The first panel was absolutely terrific, and we have uh, such a distinguished group of experts here for our panel on market manipulation. Uh, I'm so glad to be here and to have this uh, opportunity. I've been a recovering uh, regulator now for 11 years at Covington. But I joined FERC in 1993, part of the so-called um, dream team that was appointed uh, at the time. And the agency was primarily focused on restructuring the natural gas pipeline industry under Order 636. Gas markets were embryonic, and there were virtually no electricity markets at all. But that changed rapidly when we finalized Order Number 888 in 1996, opening the transmission grid for wholesale competition and allowing sellers of electric energy who lacked market power to sell at prices determined when a willing buyer and a willing seller meet in the marketplace and agree to a price. We said those kinds of rates are just and reasonable, set by the market. The court subsequently agreed with, with us. But our working assumption was that when a seller lacked market power, the prices it could fetch in the marketplace would be just and reasonable under the Federal Power Act. We, I was talking to Dick O'Neill here before the conference. Dick was the chief economist at the time I was uh, there. I have huge uh, respect for Dick. But we were trying to foster competitive uh, markets. We wanted more and more sellers to have market-based rates, not less. To qualify, We wanted them to qualify for pricing because we were trying to uh, accelerate the emergence of markets at the time. And so our test for market power was, uh, I guess you would call it uh, somewhat primitive, the, the old hub and spoke uh, analysis. And uh, in my 10 years at FERC, I cannot recall a time when a market participant failed for market, uh, for market power. Was there one, Dick? I don't think so. What were we focused on? We were focused on the market power of transmission owners and pipeline owners that we were concerned they were going to use their control over essential facilities 
to uh, favor their affiliates. And that was the main focus when I was at FERC. We strongly encouraged the formation of RTOs and ISOs with functioning spot markets. And of course, we thought that large regional markets would largely mitigate both horizontal and vertical market power. Meanwhile, with a robust gas pipeline grid, there were more than 100 market hubs for natural gas where pipelines crossed and substantial trading activity was emerging, and we were proud of that. We were pleased that our efforts to foster markets were bearing fruit. And I see Paul Moeller in the back, too. He was part of all this uh, at FERC. The California Public Service Commission was moving in parallel with FERC to promote electricity markets, and ultimately the General Assembly stepped in and enacted restructuring legislation by a unanimous vote, creating a pow separate power exchange and ISO freezing retail rates. Uh, the plan was flawed, as Bill Hogan pointed out, flawed in many respects. But I'll tell you, the entire political establishment of California was behind it. The governor, the legislature that had passed it unanimously, the entire congressional delegation wrote us a letter and said literally, don't touch a hair on its head. You got to approve this without change. And we did. It's actually the out of 28,000 votes, probably the only vote I really regret at FERC because Dick and our other economists were coming to us and saying, this thing is flawed, a separate ISO and PX. It's buy high, sell low at retail. Congestion is poor. The market's closed sequentially, as Peter Foxpenner and I have discussed many, many times. So creating an incentive to wait till the last minute to offer uh, power. But we approved it anyway, which brings up the issue of the politics of electricity markets perhaps the most political of all commodities. That's my personal view. Maybe oil is uh, more. But anyway, there's huge political pressure on FERC and other uh, institutions um, in these marketplaces, which I will talk about a little bit more. And things went well until about uh, May of 2000, when prices spiked wildly from $30 up to $250, $500, $750. Uh, in the markets and continued at high levels until we put in place a cooling off price cap in June of 2001. So we struggled to deal with the crisis based upon a flawed market design, poor congestion management, over-reliance on the spot markets, markets that close sequentially and inadequate uh, over oversight despite our fine staff. The tariffs in place did not clearly define prohibited behavior, nor did they clearly distinguish between uh, questionable behavior and legitimate arbitrage. They defined the bad behavior as anomalous bidding and gaming of the marketplace, which without much uh, more. Implicit in our rules, perhaps explicit, was that fraud was prohibited in the marketplace. Conduct such as submitting false schedules to the ISO, lying to the ISO or power exchange or FERC, or selling power as firm when it actually wasn't firm at all, or uh, fraudulently labeling products, for example. Those things I think everybody understood were, uh, were wrong. But FERC's powers of investigation, surveillance, and monitoring tools and financial penalty authorities were severely limited. FERC staff was charged with conducting a broad investigation, and their report indicated well over a dozen manipulative strategies. I think there were 16 in total that they said they believed were widely used in California. Some of them were proven, but most of this was never proven based on hard evidence or subjected to examination or cross-examination of witnesses. 
but the broad suspicion of significant manipulations uh, was certainly pervasive on Capitol Hill and at FERC. That lingered. And concerns that FERC should be better equipped with a muscular penalty authority and investigation authority led to the enactment of EPACT of 2005, which authorized FERC to investigate, as Bill Hogan points out, and Sean points out in his book, fraud-based activity in the electricity and natural gas markets. There's a line in a famous court decision, John Estes probably knows what it is, um, you know, it, the statute talks about manipulation and bad conduct, but what it catches has to be fraud in the definition. It's based on 10b-5 of the securities laws, and both CFTC and FTC now have similar fraud-based authorities. Well, as the 1960s song goes, I've looked at life from both sides now, <laughs> both as a FERC regulator and overseer of markets, and now as a private practitioner who's been involved in defending a number of market participants accused of manipulating gas and electricity markets. So here is the critical issue of tw in 2015, now that we've had so many years with this new uh, authority. What is, in fact, what is it, a device or contrivance that will offend government enforcers? Do we know what that is? Are all of us clear about that? Does the famous line from Justice Potter Stewart regarding pornography, I'll know it when I see it, does that apply here? There has to be more guidance than this, or market participants are adrift at sea. How about the sniff test? If it smells bad, don't do it. Well, actually, there are a lot of market participants that have been in the markets for a long, long time. They kind of get that. That's really what they apply. So you don't want your conduct to end up on the front page of the Los Angeles Times or Washington Post. That's really the standard. But there has to be more than that. Just smelling bad. Everybody, smeller is different. We all smell things differently. Some of us see fraud, others don't. So there has to be more. What about making rules specific and clear with hundreds, perhaps thousands of pages of guidance on do's and don'ts in markets? Well, I've just described the RTO tariffs that are in place. Those with the business manuals are sometimes thousands and thousands of pages. But what if I, as a market participant, comply with all of that, every word of it, and I act transparently, can that be fraud? Can I still be charged with fraud and suffer the reputational harm and uh, embarrassment? What if behavior in one market makes me a lot of money as a market participant in another market? Is it okay for a market participant without violating a tariff rule to exploit flaws in the market design of an RTO? So the markets are carefully designed, but nobody could think of everything. There are flaws. I'm the smartest guy in the room. I figure that out. I exploit, exploit those flaws transparently. I don't hide anything. Is that fraud? If the behavior is transparent, does it meet the definition of fraud? In a number of settlements and enforcement actions, both FERC and the CFTC have sought mightily to put some meat on the bones in defining fraud manipulation, but market participants are still insisting that basic fairness requires more definition. Well, I've been on both sides. How much definition do we need? Is it possible for regulators to anticipate every device, every contrivance in the, these complex marketplaces and define it ex ante so that everybody knows what it is, everybody has fair notice? 
Well, obviously not. Energy markets must have credibility. Strong oversight is critical. But what is the line between a measure of subjective judgment by regulators in identifying bad behavior on the one hand and ambiguity in market rules that chills legitimate market behavior, erodes liquidity in the marketplace? What is that line? Do we know what it is? And don't forget about the politics of energy markets, which I mentioned just a minute ago. When market behavior smells bad and it's all over the press, regulators are under huge pressure to do something. What should they do? Allege fraud? Clarify the rules? Both? Well, I don't know the answer to any of these questions, but our panelists do. <laughs> and I, we have a terrific uh, panel. Sean Ledgerwood is immediately to my left. Most of you know Sean. He was part of FERC enforcement for a number of years during some of the seminal days. He's an expert on all of these issues. He's a co-author of this uh, terrific uh, book along with Peter Foxpenner and others that we are discussing uh, here uh, today. He's taught uh, at, at Georgetown University, University of Oklahoma. He is uh, quite distinguished on these uh, questions and we look forward to hearing from him. At the end of the table is uh, Dr. Vince Kaminsky, professor, professor in the practice of energy management at the Jesse H. Jones Graduate School of Business Rice University. He's been thinking hard about these issues for 14 years. He worked for a number of energy companies that participated in markets and then before that Solomon uh, Brothers. He's written um, one or more books on this topic. His most recent book is called Energy Markets, published by Risk Books in January of 2013. Welcome Vince. And finally let me introduce Dan Berkovitz. Most of you know Dan from his long time at the CFTC. He was general counsel for a number of years, helped craft Dodd-Frank in that uh, capacity. And before that, he worked on Capitol Hill um, and now is a partner at Wilmer Hale. So each of our panelists will give a brief introduction when we get through with everybody, as with the previous panel, we will have a question and answer session. So I'll, I'll start with Sean uh, Ledgerwood. Sean, take it away. Thanks, Bill. Hello, everybody. Thank you very much for being here. Am I on here? Good. OK, uh, just quickly to, to uh, think about the purpose of the book. When we were first talking about writing this thing, our first thought was that we wanted to be able to explain the development of the FERC's enforcement policy over time as being a continuum. It began at the seed of the failure of the market design in the California crisis. And what became apparent there was that the tariffs that were put in place that typically perceived uh, uh, market disturbances as being a function of market power in the traditional sense just simply were not able to effectively address the types and the scope of behavior that emerged during the crisis. So what did we see? Well, over time, the agency built up its Office of Enforcement, first as OMOI, and then later as the Office of uh, Enforcement. What we saw is the development of the agency under its new fraud-based anti-manipulation rule, Rule 1C, that was a, a result of EPAC. As time went on, you saw the development of the Division of Investigations, the ultimate breakout and development of the Division of Analytics and Surveillance, and what we see today is essentially a machine that is capable of investigating independently and going after people for what it perceives to be manipulative behavior. Now, that leads to an issue of the question of what is manipulative behavior. The fact is we know that there is a gap between following the rules and what the agency might consider to be fraud. So, what divides that line is really a function that we are being uh, uh, informed over time through a series of settlements that are giving as much specificity as the agency feels necessary to give in terms of the types of behavior that are going to be considered to be in violation of Rule 1C 
even though they may not necessarily be in violation of any tariff per se. If you think about the goal of the commission and you think about the goal of legitimate market participants, everybody wants compliance. The whole goal of this process should be for people to not only know what they can't do in the marketplace, but what they can do in the marketplace. The more certainty there is in the market in terms of where that line exists, even though we know there might be always a gap, a compliance gap between the line between what's manipulative and what's legitimate, the closer we can bring those things together, the more legitimate trading that can occur, the more efficiency that can accrue from the marketplace, and the more benefits that we will see. So part of the reason why we wrote this book was to try to minimize that gap, that compliance gap between uh, what constitutes a violation that may follow uh, with behavior that may follow the rules, but yet violates the commission's rule 1C, a fraud-based manipulation rule. Now, one of the things that has vexed people is this, I know it when I see it problem, that you see all of these different enforcement cases come out and they seem somewhat episodic. And we've, we've heard lots of names being attached to manipulations, banging the clothes. Uh, we've heard in the case of Enron, several different strategies, Death Star, Get Shorty, Fat Boy. More recently in CFTC context, we've seen uh, algorithmic trading programs called the Hammer, or in an SEC context, uh, one called Gravy that was executing in order to bang the clothes. The fact is we hear all of this jargon and we have to ask ourselves the question, what exactly is it that's being prohibited? I see all of these fact patterns. I don't necessarily understand the underlying behavior. Well, the fact of the matter is there's really three types of behavior that are being prohibited under the FERC's uh, Rule 1C, fraud-based Rule 1C, and the CFTC's fraud-based rule as given by Dodd-Frank, as well as its artificial price rule that uh, was existing with the Commodities Exchange Act. The first type of behavior I think everybody's familiar with, outright fraud, acts or omissions that are just simply designed to put misinformation into the marketplace, like a false storage report. In the case of LIBOR, you have the case of false bids being put into the marketplace at the 4 p.m. Uh, uh, time with the British Bankers Association would call traders and say, hey, what's your rate? The fact is you can put false information into the marketplace. You can bias a market outcome to benefit positions that are tied to that outcome. Very straightforward. The second thing that can be used to create a manipulation is the exercise of market power. And by the way, kudos to the first panel. Y'all did a fantastic job of drawing this out. But there's kind of an interesting question when we think about the exercising of market power through an act of withholding. The fact is, if I withhold in the marketplace as a seller, say I take a unit down in order to raise the price in the marketplace, I then profit from my sales from all of the units that are online at that higher price. The fact is, if I can do that profitably, Every economics textbook under the sun will say that's what I should do. The fact is, it may not be efficient behavior, but it's logical behavior. It's profit maximizing behavior. It's not fraudulent behavior. It's not an artificial result that comes out of that. Isn't that interesting? So how could market power actually be used to execute a manipulation? Well, Jay did a fantastic job talking about Keyspan Ravens, where you have a company that but for putting a swap in place through various uh, uh, parties, would simply have reverted to the competitive price. It wouldn't benefit them to withhold in that environment, but for the swaps that gave, uh, gave them financial exposure that made the manipulation profitable through an act of withholding. Now that monopoly price is no longer a profit maximizing price all at it on its own. It's supercharged through the swap. That's a potential market manipulation. The third thing that can trigger a manipulation is far less covered in the academic literature. And frankly, we have no idea why. Gary and I were talking about it this morning. The fact is, uneconomic trading, for some reason, has been missed in most of the microeconomics literature. Yet, when we look at these various cases that are coming out from the agencies recently, the many, many of them involve what we will characterize and describe here in a moment as uneconomic trading. You see a list there. Obviously, there are a lot in electricity and gas. This is not limited to just the FERC space. This is true also of the CFTC. We saw it with uh, De Placido, which was prosecuted under its old artificial price statute. We see this in securities markets, in the case of banging the clothes, Masri Markowski and these others. We see it also in the case of commodities markets, for example, with the execution of corners. People who are executing trades for no reason other than to push a price or to bias a market outcome to benefit positions that are tied to that outcome. 
I just gave you the definition of uneconomic trading. The fact is, most of the time we think of uh, market outcomes in terms of a price. And it's certainly true that market manipulation can target a price as the nexus of the manipulation. But the reality is, we have to think more, more broadly than that. The fact is, you can be targeting an output in the marketplace. You could be targeting some process in the market. Say, for example, a mechanism that gives rise to out-of-market payments. The fact is, if you think about a manipulation more broadly, uneconomic behavior can encompass a very, very wide array of different types of activity. Now, the problem with uneconomic behavior is that it involves somebody incurring losses. Can I ask you, how many of y'all own stock? How many of y'all have never lost money? The fact is, losses are a normal market event. How do you distinguish losses that are incurred intentionally from those that are incurred with manipulation? Now, as uh, Bill had been talking about, we, we begin this process by assuming transactional legitimacy. Why we do that is frankly because of the history. Well, first off, there's a logical certainty to it. The reality is if every uh, transaction is subject to endless regulatory scrutiny, the markets are going to fall apart. Imagine if every time you were to execute a stock trade, you got a screen that said, warning, if you lose money on this trade, you could be fined a million dollars per incident per day. Not a lot of trading is going to go on as a result. There has to be a presumption of transactional legitimacy that follows open market trades. How do you overcome that presumption? Well, the way the agencies will do it is they will show evidence of repeated losses. Somebody doing something that maybe doing it once happens. Maybe doing it twice happens. But when somebody does it again and again and again, oftentimes increasing the size of what they're doing so that it becomes more and more profitable, that's evidence of intent to act uneconomically. The other thing I think was brought up earlier today as well is the objective evidence, the documentary evidence of intent. Emails, IMs, voice recordings, talking usually in a hail of F-bombs about Death Star, uh, Get Shorty, usually with other commentary that's very colorful, colorful and very uh, incriminating. When you put those two things together, what you have is a story that overcomes the, potentially overcomes the presumption of transactional legitimacy and brings the basis of a manipulation case. How long has uneconomic behavior been around? Well, as far as I can tell, about as long as competition has existed. The first example of this that I ever found was Sun Tzu's The Art of War, 600 BC, where there was a discussion of essentially faking out the enemy by committing a small number of your troops so that the enemy thinks that's your attack. They commit themselves, you flank them, and you wipe them out. You're sacrificing those few soldiers in order to win the war. Huh interesting thought. Where else have we seen this happen? Well, we've seen it happen in sports. 1919 Chicago's Red, uh, Chicago Red Sox, uh, I'm sorry, the Chicago White Sox example, is, is great. If you look at this, by the way, they were also known as the Chicago Black Sox because of this scheme. Uh, if you've ever seen the movie Eight Men Out, uh, it tells you all about the fix. What was the fix? Eight members of the White Sox going into the World Series in conjunction with their managers and organized crime placed huge bets for the White Sox to lose the World Series. And then these eight players allegedly went out and made it happen. Now, everybody looked at the situation at first and said, okay, gosh, that was crazy. They were so good all year. Well, but, you know, bad things happen. Somebody's got to lose. Only until the fix became public did the public outrage manifest itself with people calling their front offices saying, hey, baseball uh, front office, I want to cancel my season tickets. Why? What I'm watching is not a game. It's a fraud. Baseball reacted to this massive fraud. How? By banning gambling on the sport. It banned those eight players from baseball in 1920. It also wound up catching Pete Rose some 70 years later. The fact is, once there's evidence of massive fraud, massive uneconomic behavior, it threatens the credibility of whatever the institution is where that behavior is allowed to occur. So where have we seen this other times? We saw it in the case of the California crisis, massive fraud in the face of Enron and other market participants. What happened? We saw EPAC 2005, a fraud-based anti-manipulation rule put in place. We saw this happen in our financial markets in 2008. How did we respond? Through Dodd-Frank, giving the CFTC a fraud-based anti-manipulation rule. 
So this is not something that we have seen over the course of time. And if people are asking themselves the question, why am I just recently worried about this? It's because you should just be recently worried about this. These rules are really fairly new, but the type of behavior that they uh, prosecute is really quite, uh, quite easily understandable. So thinking about what this book was trying to do, it's trying to herd the cats. It's trying to take all three of these different types of behavior and say, how can we analyze manipulations in a way that's going to be consistent? It's going to be consistent across cases, consistent across products, consistent across agencies, consistent acro across rules. And what we came up with was the framework for analyzing market manipulation. The framework breaks a manipulation apart by its cause and effect. The cause of the manipulation we refer to as the manipulation's trigger. It's one or more acts that are designed to bias some market outcome or market process. The effect of the manipulation is the manipulation's target. It's one or more positions that are in place to benefit from whatever that bias is that's been created. The linkage between these two acts is what we call the nexus. It's just a causal linkage between cause and effect, trigger and target. In order to prove a manipulation, you have to show all three of these pieces being in place. But the fact is, that's not enough. We know that interactions happen in the marketplace all the time, and somebody could be owning these different pieces and seemingly manipulating the market without any intent. That's why if you look at the FERC's uh, Rule 1C, there's a standard requirement. You have to prove manipulative intent. Likewise, under the artificial price uh, statute of the CFTC. Intent is one of the four elements of that rule as well. So you have to show some level of intent going along with this. And we'll probably talk a little bit more about that here in a moment. What could trigger a manipulation? We've already talked about it. Three things. Uneconomic trading, outright fraud, the exercise of market power. What could be the target of a manipulation? Anything that benefits from the bias that's created in the trigger or by the trigger. So if it could be financial derivatives, absolutely. They're price-taking instruments. It could be phys physical positions that are tied to a particular price. Oftentimes, physical at index or traded at settlement can be an example of that. Um, net short physical positions in the marketplace can be a potential target for manipulation. If I benefit from a lower price because I buy more power than I actually uh, generate, I can try to manipulate that as well. So... One of the things that we've seen most often recently is out of market. Somebody is doing something to bias some process in order to make a mechanism in the marketplace cough out money. We saw this uh, in JP Morgan's case, and mind you, this case is done. So I, for ex parte reasons, I realize we can't talk about current cases right now. So I will uh, adhere to that. The nexus of the manipulation is whatever the process is that's being biased. It can be a price. It can be an output. It can be uh, just simply some sort of reliability mechanism or other process. The idea is that if you have all three of these pieces, you have the basis for a manipulation. Now, the way we think about this is that the trigger acts on the nexus, which acts on the target, which spits out the manipulation's profit. You'll notice that uneconomic trading is in red, and there's a red arrow there. Let me explain that. In the case of outright fraud and the exercise of market power, once the profits come out of the machine, you're done. The fact is the manipulation is now profitable because we're assuming the fraud is costless or we're assuming the market power, by exercising it, you benefit yourself on a standalone basis. By comparison, what happens when somebody puts uneconomic information into the marketplace? What if somebody just throws volume into the market as a price taker to buy us a price up or down? The fact is they're losing money in doing that. There is a cost associated with for the manipulation to be profitable overall, the profits from the manipulation must exceed that cost. We have a name for it if that is not so. For example, let's say I lose a million dollars in the alleged trigger. And after we cycle through this, I make back $500,000 in the alleged target. I got a name for that target. It's called a hedge. And it's a perfectly legitimate use of whatever it is that's being alleged to be a target. The fact is, if I lose a million dollars and I make a million dollars, there's a name for that as well. It's a perfect hedge. Again, a perfectly legal use of whatever it is that's alleged to be the target. 
The nice thing about the framework is it provides a basis for distinguishing potentially legitimate behavior, such as hedging, from manipulative behavior. As the amount of financial leverage in this thing grows above one to one, so as I lose a million, I make two million, three million, five million, 30 million, I've seen 60 million. As you see this leverage increase, that target has no longer been, been a hedge. It is now a speculative position that's designed to be manipulated. As somebody goes through this again and again and again, it becomes very hard for them to make the argument, oh, this was just a hedge. It becomes more and more likely that this is going to be interpreted as a manipulation. If you have all these pieces and you can combine them, they give you the economic evidence of intent. If you then have emails, IMs, voice recordings on top of it, the manipulation can be proven. So we've put this out there, and we, of course, are interested in your thoughts as to uh, this framework as, is, as it is applicable over time. Uh, Bill actually put the enforcement version of the framework into his presentation, so I don't feel the need to put it in here. But the fact is, this is an objective way to think about the process of either prosecuting a manipulation, or if you prefer, to defend against the manipulation. One of the main reasons I like using it is because it's also a tool for compliance. If traders come to me and say, Ledgerwood, I haven't got a clue what it is the agencies are coming after me for. Can you explain it? Yes, you can explain it. You can explain it as having these pieces, and you can explain to them intentional uneconomic behavior is going to be prosecuted as fraud. So with that, I'll turn to the next panelist. So uh, my name is Vince Kaminska. I'm associated with Rice University, but I am speaking uh, on, uh, uh, in my own capa personal capacity. Uh, I am going to uh, start by uh, posing a number of questions, and I will start uh, answering uh, uh, some of those questions. So the first, you know, the first question is, uh, do we uh, have uh, to worry about market manipulation in the energy markets? It doesn't happen at all, or if it happens, uh, uh, does the size uh, and consequences justify the enforcement efforts? You know, and my answer is yes. Manipulation in the energy markets happen. I have spent uh, uh, many years in the trenches of energy trading, and it would be very difficult to convince me that in the world where so many markets, so many big markets are manipulated on a, on a massive scale, sometimes in a very primitive way, energy markets are somewhat somehow immunized against the market manipulation. So it's very difficult for me to believe that uh, energy markets are somehow a shining city on the hill, uh, an oasis in the desert, a hidden valley, where, where market manipulation, for some strange reason, doesn't happen, but it happens everywhere else. Uh, so the questions I want to ask is uh, uh, what makes uh, uh, or what facilitates market manipulation in the energy markets and uh, what makes uh, detection difficult? And I would like to uh, zero in on uh, two uh, special features of the energy markets. You know, one feature is uh, the market microstructure or price uh, discovery and price formation process in the energy markets. And the second uh, special feature of the energy markets is complexity. So let's start with, uh, uh, with uh, the, uh, the price uh, formation and price uh, discovery processes in the energy markets. And I am going to step back from the discussion in the previous panel, which uh, evolved around the electricity markets, I am going to talk about the energy complex in general. So when you look at many energy markets, not all the energy markets, uh, you uh, you'll find out that many energy markets uh, uh, remind, from the point of view of uh, price formation, uh, two inverted uh, uh, pyramids with one pyramid sitting on top of another. So what is the first inverted pyramid? It, the problem is that in, the, in many energy markets, you know, most volumes flowing uh, from the producers to the end users are priced under floating price transactions, trigger transactions, formulaic uh, price transactions, uh, which reference 
uh, as uh, sometimes a very narrow set of uh, market prices. And uh, uh, what happens is that if somebody can influence those prices, which determines the values of the huge, huge volume of uh, 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 floating price uh, uh, or variable price transactions, uh, one can extract uh, uh, huge profits uh, uh, f f from a given market. So this is one inverted pyramid. The second inverted pyramid is that those uh, special benchmark prices, uh, special reference uh, prices, uh, uh, are sometimes uh, determined uh, through interactions of a very small group of market participants. In the case of some price indices in the natural gas markets, one company can represent just 100% uh, 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 of the volumes which go into determination of a price index, <coughs> which, is, uh, uh, which is used uh, for a settlement of a specific transaction. Thanks a lot. I can, I can take it from here. Thank you. Right in time. Right in time because I wanted to, I wanted to show you a, I wanted to show you a, this, a graph. Yeah, this is. Okay. Okay. So this is, you know, so this is, you know, so this is one example uh, of uh, the physical. Uh, uh, physical uh, uh, transactions in the uh, U.S. natural gas markets in 2009, uh, uh, about 70% uh, uh, of the volumes, you know, were based uh, on daily or monthly uh, price uh, price indices, and uh, uh, those indices were in turn uh, determined by, uh, in some cases, and at some specific market hubs, by a small group. Uh, by a small group of companies. You know, another example of the inverted pyramid in many markets, uh, we have a, a, a NYMEX a natural gas contract, which uh, uh, settles on a regular trading day based on the two minutes of transactions uh, just prior to the close. On the contract expiration date, uh, the uh, settlement price is determined by the volume weighted transaction prices during the last 30 minutes or 30 minutes of trading. And those settlement prices can be used for pricing of a large volume of different swaps, uh, bullet swaps forwards, which may trade OTC or may trade on, uh, on other exchanges. You know, another example, Brent, uh, Brent Complex. Uh, the Brent benchmark uh, underlies pricing of about 65 to 70 to 70 percent of world oil and we are talking about uh, the, the grade of crude oil which has been effectively drilled out of existence you know it's effectively the old brand doesn't exist any longer and i'll talk about brand in a moment when i when i talk uh, talk about uh, complexity so so we have about one percent of the daily output of crude oil used to price about 65 to 70 percent of all the volumes flowing uh, uh, daily through the market. Refined products, uh, the price indices for refined products are based on transactions representing 5 to 10 percent of overall volumes. So this means that if somebody can figure out how to manipulate a specific index and has huge positions in other transactions, uh, physical or financial, uh, where one can uh, uh, obtain a, a very significant profit. And, and uh, on top of it, we can, to, to, to what I have just described, we can uh, add another inverted pyramid. When we talk about financial derivatives, we are talking about transactions which offer in incredible uh, leverage. So this means that uh, uh, by uh, manipulating prices which are used for, for settlement of derivative contracts, you know, one can add leverage inherent in the in the derivative in the der derivative transactions. Market complexity. So it's uh, you know my uh, uh, deep uh, 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 opinion. My uh, my op opinion based on many years uh, 
in the energy markets is that uh, we cannot talk about uh, and we cannot discuss separate energy markets. Over the last uh, 20 years, energy markets evolved into an integrated global system. And this is a, and this is a system where shocks are transmitted uh, between different parts through channels of transmission which are constantly evolving. And on top of it, the energy markets have uh, three layers, which may make them devilishly complicated. So we have the physical layer, which covers, includes processes related to production, transportation, storage, and distribution of energy commodities and fixed assets supporting these processes. We have the financial layer of physical and financial transactions related to energy commodities. And we have the social political layer of rules, laws and conventions underlying commodity markets. And, uh, the, and different energy markets, uh, which cut across all these layers, can be compared to gray boxes. Not black boxes, not white boxes. Gray boxes, uh, we understand to some extent, which are interconnected, but are not fully, not fully understood. And as you know, as every, every, everybody familiar with the New York Times bestseller list knows, there are many shades of gray. You know, so there are many, there are many, you know, there are transactions, there are markets with, uh, 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 with uh, a lot of uh, openness, which are very open, very transparent, and, and then there are markets which are uh, quite opaque. And this is, you know, where people who want to manipulate the markets will uh, typically will typically migrate. When we talk about the complexity of energy markets, we have two types of complexity. You know, this is man-made complexity, and uh, sometimes complexity may be a result of spontaneous development. A great economist, Friedrich Hayek, said that the markets are the result of human action, but not the execution of any human design. And in general, this is true. The markets, we, with the markets which evolved in a spontaneous way were a great engine of social and economic progress. But there are markets which are the result of human design. Uh, worse, you know, there are, there are markets which are the result of the design by a committee. And it, it applies especially to the electricity market. And when you look at the typi typical electricity market, what comes to mind is the definition of a camel, a horse uh, which was designed by a committee. And uh, uh, the, uh, le the level of complexity of those markets is such that you know, they typically don't work in the, f in the first pass through. So you start adding patches on top of other patches, and uh, sooner or later you have a system so complicated that very clever humans can run circles around, you know, and this is where Enron, famous Enron strategies uh, come, uh, 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 come to uh, as uh, good examples. And uh, on top of it, you have, uh, you know, documentation, which is typically beyond mental abilities of typical mortals. You know, it's, it's obvious that documentation, you can, you, 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 you can study to understand the operations of any power pool were written by people who were not uh, 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 pets of uh, their English teachers. And in, some, uh, and, uh, in, uh, and in some cases, in some cases, it's even worse. Because, you know, when it comes to the European Union, the documentation for the market, uh, power market design, you know, has to be translated into, into all the languages of the European Union. And it uh, brings to mind uh, an aphorism of the 18th century German philosopher Lichtenberg, who defined a donkey as a, a horse translated into Dutch. Uh, <laughs> with, uh, with, my, with my apologies to anybody of Dutch ancestry, ancestry here. But it's obvious that uh, a lot is lost, uh, a lot is lost in, uh, in, in, in translation. So another example of market complexity is the brand market. So we are talking about the brand market. You know, everybody assumes that uh, it's a simple price you can see on the uh, uh, CNBC screen uh, all the time. In reality, this is a very complex system, which, uh, is, which consists of uh, four different layers. We have the so-called 
dated brand, which uh, is composed of uh, four different uh, crudes, uh, brand, uh, for the 40s, uh, Oseberg and Ecofisk, except that the brand is not what the brand used to be, the so-called uh, uh, brand blend, which doesn't have a lot in common with the original brand the crude. Then we have uh, the brand forward contract. We have brand OTC swaps and options, including the so-called contracts for differences, which, which are used in pricing physical cargoes. And then we have the ICE uh, futures brand contract, uh, which is used for uh, pricing uh, 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 crudes going into many directions from a number of producing countries. And, uh, and this is a system which is basically a financial system which has a very narrow thread connecting it with the physical market. And this is the exchange for physicals. And, you know, and of course, you know, all the students I teach uh, aspire to become traders and they all want to trade brand. When, when, I, when I teach them about the brand market, and it takes about a good two hours, you know, just, just, just to make an introduction, I am telling them that uh, there were only five people in history who understood the brand market. The problem is that one of them died, the second retired, you know, the third went mad, uh, the fourth is drinking wine and is not uh, taking uh, any calls, and the fifth uh, is in the witness protection uh, program. <laughs> and, uh, and this means that they, that they have to pray that what I tell them about brand is correct. <laughs> so uh, there are other uh, uh, questions in which uh, I could, uh, which I could uh, uh, wanted to pose. I have no time to uh, really uh, uh, elaborate on them. But you know, one, uh, one problem we have is uh, how we can detect market manipulation, and it goes to Sean's presentation. And the second is how can we put in place effective counter manipulation policy measures, you know, without uh, destroying the market and uh, without allocating uh, excessively large resources uh, to this task. But you know, but this is the question for the entire, entire panel. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Bill, and for the uh, conference for uh, inviting me to participate. It's a great honor to be uh, on with uh, such uh, other distinguished panelists today. I, I would just note that uh, when I was working on Capitol Hill and I had a question about the Brent market, I called up uh, Vince and I actually was in Houston one day and you met me in a hotel like at 10 o'clock at night after I flew in to explain the Brent market to me. So there's actually six people <laughs> I think understand the Brent market. <laughs> Uh, I'm going to talk about the uh, anti-manipulation authority under the Commodities uh, Futures Trading Commission. And so we're going to be moving from electricity and energy briefly into soybeans and, and wheat and frozen concentrated orange juice and, and eggs. But it, it does tie back into energy because now, of course, the CFTC's jurisdiction is much broader than uh, what it started out with, which was the grain markets. Uh, the CFTC, uh, the predecessor to the CFTC, the Commodity Exchange Authority, was actually started in uh, 1922. It was one of the first uh, uh, federal regulatory statutes that regulated the, uh, the grain markets. And there was an anti-manipulation provision put into the original Commodity uh, Exchange Act, uh, the Grain Futures Act, uh, back then, which uh, uh, said that uh, anybody who attempted to manipulate the price could be uh, prohibited from trading uh, on the exchange. And there were uh, many people at the time who believed that the authority in the Act, uh, the, the 22 Act, was not stringent enough, and there were hearings throughout the 1920s. And just briefly, why was this such an issue in the 1920s? Why did they pass this Act in 1922? If you look at the history of the Commodity Exchange Act, every time there's been financial uh, uh, crisis or uh, fluctuations in commodities prices that have been very significant to the economy, this led to uh, significant amendments to the Commodity Exchange Act. Um, in the 20s, the problem was actually a surplus of grain. The United States was the grain supplier to the world, basically, during the First uh, World War, when all the fields in Europe and, and elsewhere were torn up. Uh, after the war was over and uh, grain supplies elsewhere in the world increased, uh, there was an excess of supply, grain prices in, in the U.S. decreased, and, of course, who was to blame? Well, it was speculators at the time. Uh, 
So uh, manipulation and the cause for these price fluctuations was a hot topic in the 1920s. Uh, as the, it uh, says on the archives on Pennsylvania Avenue, um, one of the uh, inscriptions on the statutes, uh, statues there, uh, what is past is prologue. Uh, there was a, a very notable testimony by one of the presidents of one of the exchanges at the time. Um, he was asked, uh, what, is, what does uh, manipulation mean? And he says, I think manipulation means whatever the gentlemen on the other side of the table think it means. Basically, it's been undefined and difficult to define ever since the, the term has been talked about and a lack of precision. The second uh, great amendment or changes to the Commodity Exchange uh, Act was when they passed the Commodity Exchange Act in 1936 in, in the midst of the Great Depression. Again, the authorities in the 1922 Act were uh, perceived by many as inadequate to control manipulation, to control excessive speculation. Uh, the Congress gave the Commodity Exchange Authority the direction to put position limits to limit the size of positions on the exchanges, which has been another controversial issue ever since, as well as beef up the anti-manipulation authority. The fundamental anti-manipulation authority in the Commodity Exchange Act that um, existed uh, for more than 70 years until it was amended or added onto by Dodd-Frank a few years ago uh, dates back to 1936, which makes it illegal to manipulate or attempt to manipulate the price of any commodity in interstate commerce, not just futures, but any commodity in, in interstate commerce uh, or uh, contract for future delivery. At the time, there were only uh, contracts for future delivery still in, in grains. Uh, Congress over the years added specific commodities uh, to be uh, required to be traded on exchanges and regulated over the years. Finally, in 1974, they just said whatever there's a future contract in is, is a commodity and all futures contracts have to be regulated by the CFTC. So there was no longer the, just the grains, it could be any commodity. And of course, with the advent of the energy markets uh, and energy trading starting in around 1980 and on, the energy futures markets uh, and energy uh, futures trading came within the authority of the CFTC. Uh, the next significant change in the CE and the C, uh, CFTC's authority, sort of on the opposite end of the spectrum, in 2000, the Commodity Futures Modernization Act, and rather have a crisis uh, that the markets uh, weren't working, and so you needed more regulatory authority. Uh, when the CFMA was enacted, it was really at the height of the uh, just before the uh, internet boom crashed and the markets uh, were thought to be working wonders. And the last thing they needed was a lot of government intervention. So the CFMA was basically a deregulatory statute in terms of the CFTC's authority and said you cannot regulate the swaps market. The swaps market is doing just fine. We don't need the CFTC uh, to, uh, to start uh, messing in that market. Then, of course, we had the financial crisis in 2007, where the opposite belief was that the markets needed more regulation, and the lack of regulation was the reason that we had the crisis in 2007-8, so Dodd-Frank regulated the swaps markets. Uh, the, as, I, as I said, the CFTC's anti-manipulation authority, the basic authority, making it illegal to manipulate the price of any commodity in interstate commerce or for future delivery, it's been in the act since 1936. Well, the CFTC basically, it didn't really uh, look at manipulation in, in regular commodity prices. It was concerned with manipulation on the exchanges. And what was manipulation on the exchanges was really in the context of corners and squeezes. As your contracts for future delivery went to settlement, you had to deliver the, the commodity. There was the potential for a squeeze. And the cases before the CFTC, as it decided what does manipulation mean, were all developed in the context of these squeezes, squeezes of orange juice, squeezes of eggs, uh, squeezes of soybeans, uh, things like that. Uh, from the beginning, it was a combination of judicial development plus CFTC development as to what the term manipulation meant. And one of the judicial cases, which is fundamental, um, fundamental in CFTC jurisprudence is, there must be a purpose to create prices not responsive to the forces of supply and demand the conduct must be calculated to produce a price distortion. And there are several cases uh, along those lines. Um, there were a number of cases in the 1980s, administrative cases where the CFTC elaborated on the, on the judicial standards. Uh, most notable case, a case called Indiana Farm Bureau. The CFTC, the commission says, to meet that 
standard of creating a, uh, intentionally creating artificial prices, it's the CFTC declared you must show specific intent to create an artificial price. And in a case, uh, an administrative case a few years later, the CFTC articulated what's commonly referred to as the four-part test, which I think Sean referred to. The four-part test laid out four elements for proving manipulation. One, the accused had the ability to influence market prices. Two, they specifically intended to do so, influence market prices, that artificial prices existed and that the accused created the artificial price. So there's four elements. Now, several of those elements were just very, became very, very difficult for the commission to prove. How do you prove a specific intent to create an artificial price? We're talking the days before email, too. Okay, without emails, how do you prove somebody specifically intended to create an official price? Even with emails, it can be difficult, but people tend not to litigate when there's bad emails. But if you don't have the emails, it makes it much, much harder. Uh, that artificial prices existed. How do you determine what an artificial price is? And this became, for the CFTC, uh, CFTC had its team of economists, and the, on the other side, there were other teams of economists and that the accused caused the artificial price. So the burden of proof for the CFTC was very, very difficult. From around 1980 to 2011, there was one contested case, one contested manipulation case that went to judgment. That was the De Placido case, again, which Sean referred to, manipulation of the electricity markets. It took the CFTC 10 years from the time it brought the case to the time it was concluded in the U.S. Court of Appeals the De Placido case. And the De Placido case was actually a relatively simple case because in De Placido, the, uh, Anthony De Placido, the defendant, this is a, uh, uh, a uh, formal judicial opinion, so I don't have to qualify and say alleged because it's written in, in the case law. De Placido bid more than he had to. This was a clear case of uneconomic trading. And yet even in what you would think would be a simple case, took the CFTC 10 years. So there was great frustration with the case law as it had developed uh, over the years in the, in the CFTC context. The markets had evolved. The CFTC was looking at a lot more than simply uh, corners and squeezes. This culminated in, in, in Dodd-Frank uh, giving the CFTC uh, additional authority. And one of the additional authorities that, that the Congress gave the CFTC was the same standard that it had given FERC uh, in 2005 uh, that was uh, the bills talked about, uh, and and uh, uh, to uh, based on the SEC's 10B standard. And the reason uh, Congress likes that standard, the, it's a fraud-based standard, but it also the intent element is uh, can be shown by um, recklessness. Uh, you don't have to prove specific intent to create an artificial price. You don't necessarily have to have that. Uh, uh, email that you can, according to the agency, the agency's interpretation of the statute, I need to be careful here because this all isn't yet uh, developed out in the case law, whether indeed that same standard that the SEC applies necessarily translates 100% over into the commodities market. But the attraction is for the sponsors of the language, as well as for the way the CFTC has written the rule, is you can prove uh, um, your case by showing recklessness that the person's conduct was so extreme that they should have known that an artificial price was, be, was being created. You don't need to prove they specifically intended to create the artificial price. So now the CFTC has its, its pre-existing anti-manipulation authority, which is, makes it illegal to manipulate the price of any commodity, as well as the fraud-based, what also the courts have referred to as catch-all uh, anti-manipulation authority that both the SEC and, and, and the FERC have. In addition, and, and uh, one of the things that we were um, uh, uh, faced with as we were doing Dodd-Frank, and I'm putting on my agency hat now speaking in my former, former role with the agency, and this is what, uh, a theme that's been talked about today, especially um, what, what, what the book uh, uh, sets out, is to try to make a test for manipulation that's easier, that, that, that you don't have to have those four elements that the CFTC has said. Is there certain conduct? that you can just state this is inherently bad conduct for a market. And the intent element is simply to engage in that bad conduct. It's not that you have to cr intentionally manipulate the price, but the conduct is inherently of such a nature that if you intentionally engage in it, you know that it's going to mess up the market. 
And that's the basis for the, the what called in the legislation and now in the Commodity Exchange Act, disruptive trading practices. We decided not to call it manipulation because manipulation is also, the term manipulation is all sorts of red flags and bells and whistles. And if we had said specific anti-manipulation authority, um, that would have uh, gotten a larger debate about what's manipulation. But we labeled it disruptive trading practices and maybe it helped it get a little below the radar at the time uh, we were considering it. But the commission approved it the Congress adopted it. The disruptive trading practices, specific ones laid out in the statute are three things. Violates bids and offers. If you bid more than you have to, if, you, if, if, the, if uh, somebody's willing to sell something for you for $10 and you pay 15 for it, why would you do that? That's uneconomic. That's inherently manipulative. That's the DePlacido case. That's what took the commission 10 years to prove. Now, there's no intent element in, in the uh, violating bids and offers in the statute. If you violate a bid or an offer, that's a disruptive trading practices. The commission doesn't have to prove intent. The other one is spoofing. We've seen three recent cases of, of spoofing. Spoofing is bidding or offering with intent to cancel before execution. You put a bid or offer in with no intent that it should be executed. Why would you do that other than to send a false signal into the market? If you don't want a transaction, you shouldn't be sending a signal into, into the market. So that's the second disruptive practice. The third disruptive practice is um, uh, uh, intentional disregard, uh, uh, trading with an, an intentional disregard of the uh, rec let me get it right, demonstrates intentional or reckless disregard for the orderly execution of transactions during the closing period. Now, just when we submitted that language, um, we said, commonly known as banging the close, um, the congressional staff, when we took it up, said, this language is unacceptable. And we said, why? He said, you can't call it banging the close. So we took out banging the close, <laughs> left the other language in, and, and, and it's, um, it's, it's part of the statute now. So what, we, what the CFTC was trying to do with disruptive trading practices was to identify inherently um, disruptive or inher really inherently manipulative practices that you didn't need to show artificial price, you didn't need to show intent. And uh, the Congress accepted that, and that's in the statute. There's three spoofing cases um, active right now. It's turned out to be a very powerful authority. The commission has started to exercise its uh, uh, anti-manipulation authority under the 10B standard, although in all the cases, current cases, they've done it. It's also concurrent with the, the uh, pre-existing standards. So we really haven't seen full exercise or the potential full exercise or how far the commission's going to go with its new um, fraud-based manipulation standard. But the perennial issue of how to define manipulation, how to prove it, what's the intent, what, what's the prices, that, that is still there. The commission's basic authority is unchanged and there are these still unresolved questions. It's what, as Bill was talking about, the, the, our agency was struggling the same things that you struggle, struggled with uh, over at the FERC. When prices fluctuate wildly and there's uh, pressure, um, the, agency, the agency wants to respond. You don't want to tie yourself, from the agency's perspective, you don't want to tie yourself into strict definitions. Uh, you want that flexibility because people think of new ways to manipulate the markets. On the other hand, putting my private sector hat on now, clients, uh, people in the market, they want to know what's legal or what's not legal. They want to know, can I do this? Can I do that? Um, I'm not interested in manipulating the market. I'm interested in making some money. I want to, you know, protect myself. Uh, you know, I, want to, I want to hedge. I want to um, invest. I want to do whatever I want to do. I want to do it in a legal way. Can you tell me if I do this, whether it's legal or not? And you say, well, it depends. Da, da, da. It's not a very satisfactory um, answer to, to clients. But that's, that's the tension, that's the tension that, that we deal with. So um, thank you. And, um, hopefully there's time for questions. That's great. Thank you. I have to apologize for my cough. Uh, I know it's obnoxious, but there's nothing I can do about it. So there. Um, I have a question for Sean. Is a fraud-based manipulation rule appropriate for dealing with market power issues? Well, so the example that we discussed in Keyspan shows an example where it would be. When you, when you think about the exercise of market power as being something that's logical to exercise, and in some markets, we want people to exercise market power. ERCOT has a scarcity pricing 
desire because that gives uh, because there's no capacity market. Uh, market participants need to recover the fixed cost of their generation units. So there, when someone is exercising market power, it's a logical thing to do on a standalone basis. It really shouldn't be thought of as being uh, fraudulent in any sense. The only time that it could become fraudulent is if that exercise of market power, that withholding to create the price increase, is insufficiently funded by the remaining units in the market such that uh, in order to make the uh, scheme profitable, you have to go outside of that market, say, for example, having CFTC jurisdictional swaps. Uh, if it's those combined revenues that makes the uh, active withholding profitable, then yes, market manipulation can construe fraud. I'm sorry, uh, uh, the exercise of market power can construe fraud. Vince or Dan, any comment on that? Well, you know, I think that in the case of uh, uh, market power and electri electricity markets, in, in my understanding, and I am not a lawyer, you know, we have really a, a clash of two, of two, of two different legal, legal doctrines. So on one hand, uh, Fer the FERC says that the prices should be, you know, just and reasonable. And on the other hand, you know, you have uh, the laws uh, which, uh, you know, don't punish as such market power. You know, exercising market power, in my understanding, is legitimate. Many monopolies engage and, uh, and uh, oligopolies engage in such behavior. The problem is the, when, you, when you have a clash of two different uh, legal doctrines, and the question is which one prevails. And, you know, and this would be the question for the lawyers to, 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 to answer. I, I could certainly see the possibility that an aggressive division of enforcement would potentially argue that if you have market power, uh, then the prices that result do not legitimately reflect the proper su forces of supply and demand, and that uh, it's a quote an artificial price. Um, I haven't, I don't recall that they have done that yet, but I could conceive of that. Mm -hmm. I have uh, a few questions here, but I want to give the audience a chance uh, as well. Bill Hogan. Uh, raised, and that's uh, which has always troubled me. This problem of uh, I can't write clear rules because I don't know everything that can be done, and I can't anticipate everything. And so, you know, how to, but then people don't know what to do, and and we have flaws in the market, you know. And it's sort of how do you get out of that box? And it seems to me that I mean the best idea that I've been able to think of is a version of a disclosure requirement. So the, if you're going to trade in these markets and take advantage of all the apparatus we put in place, and you find something that looks fishy, um, uh, you have an obligation to disclose it to the enforcement people. Um, and uh, it's confidential, that disclosure. Um, and the enforcement people have an obligation to do one of two things. One is to issue a general directive to the entire market, not just you, and says, you, nobody can do this. We, we hadn't thought about that, but now nobody can do this. Or two, fix the market design so this doesn't, you know, is not profitable anymore. And once you've satisfied your disclosure requirement, now you can go trade on what you're planning to do, um, and you're, have, you have a safe harbor. So you, you get out of the problem of, uh, that we run into with the enforcement office uh, doing a pocket veto, which is you ask, can I do this, and they never answer the question, you know, which is what a problem that we have uh, with the existing system. Um, and you don't have to identify every possible flaw in advance, and if somebody wants to take advantage of it without disclosure, then they're subject to all the manipulation stuff uh, afterwards. Uh, but you can allow aggressive trading because people can now start taking advantage of things you hadn't thought of, and if you haven't got a way to deal with it, you just say, you know, that's okay, and we allow you to do that. So the production tax credit for wind would survive, and people would exploit the production tax credit for wind in the way they're doing that I don't like, but nonetheless, we, you know, that would be a mechanism by, which would be acceptable. And the uh, nonsense of exploiting the end of the day uh, ramping requirements for, uh, you know, generation would not survive because any idiot could look at it and say, no, geez, that was a mistake. We shouldn't have done that. We could fix that rule and have it. So it seems to me that that 
obligation on the people participating in the markets to disclose things that they think are suspicious. Uh, and then they get a safe harbor. And then it imposes an obligation on the enforcement office at the same time. They have to do something in particular, not just anything that they want. Uh, gets us out of that box. And you are talking about the disclosure by the internal compliance people. Well, well, I don't know. I mean, the, the, the traders. So, you know. Okay, but, you know, they have compliance people in every firm who. Yeah, that who, would be fine. Would report, I, I, right? The mechanics of who does it, I don't know. But okay. the company, Deutsche Bank, would have to, you know, they're not there anymore. So Deutsche Bank would, would have to go and tell you. Um, geez, we discovered this uh, screwball thing in the California uh, pricing degeneracy. We don't quite understand it, but we think it's a mistake, and da 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 and this is what we're going to do. Now they, their obligation is finished. Now they can go trade against it unless there's an, an announcement that says, oh, we discovered a software flaw uh, in the Cal ISO. Nobody can take advantage of that. Or we changed the market design and how we actually do it, and there is no software flaw anymore. That would be the, the case. Why don't, why don't we do that? Well, so, so the other extreme relative to what you're saying is that let's say we have a broken market rule, somebody exploits it, whether they report it or not, let's say they report it. We come after them and say, oh, well, you've been exploiting this for X amount of period of time, give us the money back, and oh, by the way, we may bring an enforcement action against you for, for violating the market rules. I think that's, that's probably more extreme necessarily than what happens now. Um, again, to me, the idea is certainty. How do you create certainty of giving people the incentive to trade legitimately in the marketplace? And your point is that there are market flaws, market design issues that are broken, that maybe even implicitly there might be uh, some blessing from a regulatory agency that says, yeah, go ahead and do this, this market's fixed. Go ahead and keep pulling that slot machine's arm, even though uh, it might turn out that it's broken. Um, yeah. Which My is in view, the eye of the beholder, that's the problem. Well, it, and so that's really kind of the problem of, of ever finding manipulation though, right? Is, is, is there ever a level of intent that is sufficient to go beyond that line of, oh, hey, I was just taking advantage of what the market... Yeah, because had. you didn't notify it. So, so, I mean, Bill, the way I like to think about it is from the standpoint of efficiency. If I'm doing something in the marketplace that's trying to make money on a standalone basis, the fact is that's, that should be a safe harbor in and of itself. If I'm, if I'm a, 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 a trader and I see a way to make money, uh, the fact is if I execute that trade, and it makes money for me on a standalone basis, or even if it loses money on a standalone basis, as long as my motivation was to make money on that trade, that should be a safe harbor. The concern is when people come into the market and intentionally do something uneconomic, intentionally lose money, because that creates inefficiency in the marketplace. And that's well, if that's willful, that's a problem. That's why I'm using the wind production tax credit <laughs> as my generic example. That is a trade where you lose money. You offer your real costs are zero, and you offer you know physical costs are zero, and you offer it in at minus twenty three dollars a megawatt hour, and it drives the price down to minus eighteen or minus twenty three dollars. And then over here, you're making it up because you get paid the production tax credit by the government for all of the wind that you actually produce. I don't see how that's any different yeah. than the kinds of things that you're saying are condemned, but we support that. I, so, I, I, I try to give you an answer. If from, as an insider, somebody who was working inside many, many different big firms. So to, to a large extent, what you have described happens without going to the regulators. Sometimes when the compliance people see that something is going on that is not necessarily criminal, but is questionable, can put at risk the reputation of the firm, they act. And, you know, I remember that in Enron, we had, a, we had a case of the traders who discovered that in one power pool there were, there were different rules for rounding, uh, with depending on whether you bought or sold. So you would so so the traders were started selling 24.5 megawatts instead of 24 or 25. So they took they took advantage of the different rounding rules. You know when they behave, they didn't behave like teenagers. You know given uh, credit cards and uh, uh, and keys to the car, they behaved like teenagers given uh, given a, a key. Uh, to the nuclear power plant. But, uh, you know, fortunately for Enron, you know, the compliance people moved in and stopped this behavior. But, you know, what you describe, and so it happens to some extent, you know, there are some responsible people who will act. They sometimes without going, mostly without going to the regulators because, you know, they don't want it to, to, to get uh, too much visibility. The problem is that, you know, that with the procedure you describe, you know, would work perfectly in the world uh, populated by f uh, former Boy Scouts. You know, people who are, you know, people who act always, 
it, 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 under the highest ethical standards. The problem is that if you work in a big corporation and there is a trader X who is making a lot of money, there is, you know, uh, you know th th there is a tendency across the entire management, you know, management uh, chain to, to stop asking questions. People don't ask questions, you know, look the other way. And I could spend the entire evening giving you examples of different markets and, the, and situations like this one. A trader makes a lot of money, nobody asks uh, questions. And there is one case, recent case is Jerome Carviel, a trader for Societe Generale who lost $5 billion. You know, there are, you know, if, uh, in, in the French newspapers, there were some reports that the entire management above him knew about it, but they were ignoring his uh, risky trading because he was making a lot of money. Only if you lose money, then the problems start. So in a perfect world, this would work. And this is the way it's, I would agree with you that this is the way it should work. You see, you have a, question, a reasonable question, you ask the question, you, you probably should get, get a safe harbor, you know, so you are not, if you, re, if you report a potential problematic behavior, you are not punished for it, you know, and then the, the instruction is issued to the rest of the market that something should stop. This is an ideal solution, but it's a solution for an ideal world, you know, so whether it would... I, I, don't, I, just, I, I think that conclusion is wrong. I, I just don't think it does depend on an ideal world. It doesn't depend on Boy Scouts. It depends on, you know, people are profit maximizing, mm -hmm. and if they want to take a, if they notify you, now they can exploit it, then they have a safe harbor. If they don't notify you, they're subject to the rules, and we don't have to angst over the problem of how do we write clear rules, yeah, which yeah. is we don't know, because we don't know how to do it, as Bill says. I, I think in, but here, they're, we have an answer for them, and if they want to take that chance and then get subject to ex post prosecution for manipulation, that's fine. I'm, I'm not an expert in airline safety, but there's a great show on uh, called Air Disasters, and every week they talk about the plane crash and why it crashed and, and how, as a result, um, airline safety is improved when the NTSB investigates and there's remedial actions and the airlines are open. And I, my understanding is that pilots get, get to self-report uh, without fear of regulatory action. Um, and if there's a culture and a and a, a way of doing business in, in that industry where safety issues can be reported without fear of regulatory violations. At least that's my understanding. That's not where we are in this. I mean, and certainly in, the, in this industry, re reporting things, self-reporting, there's no um, expectation or no feeling that you're going to get credit for it and that you're, you're actually going to get some, probably some enforcement action that won't be as bad as if you didn't report, but it nonetheless can still be, still be bad, and that's a, a, that was a significant deterrent to implementing that type of thing, that people are very, very reluctant to self-report in this, in this industry for fear of enforcement action. Bill and I have talked about this. He knows I like that idea. I think it's a good idea to solve a very hard problem, and it might not work perfectly, but I think it's a good start. So. I applaud you for thinking about it and uh, proposing it. I am told that we only have time for uh, one more question. Is there a question from the audience? Bill Hederman, who was uh, head of enforcement during part of the time when I was at FERC. Thanks, Bill. Uh, clearly, the bills are dominating this discussion. <laughs> um, and we, as you may recall from Pat Wood, I did not head enforcement. It, we very carefully kept that word out and called it market oversight and investigations. And, and the reason was that our colleagues in industry said, I'm having a conversation with you about the markets right now. If you were a head of enforcement, I'd have my lawyer in this conversation with us. And we thought it was more important to find out what was going on in the markets in those crazy beginning years. But uh, that, that was a move that Chairman Kelleher made uh, after uh, EPAC 2005. So uh, th it's, it wasn't like an unconscious thing. That was a very conscious decision. But I was going to suggest another uh, device that we used in those market oversight days and see what your reaction is to this. We. You know, one of the big problems that we didn't quite get into, well, I guess a little bit about the gray box, is settlements don't tell you everything that people on the outside would like to know. 
Uh, one thing we tried to do in some settlements when we had particular leverage in a situation was develop a really strict uh, compliance regime and that would get specified in the, in the settlement. And then at least those measures were all then out in the public record and said, here's a compliance regime that FERC has found acceptable. And while it didn't get into all the practices, it at least also gave you some kind of elements of safe harbor. I'd be interested in the panel's reaction to that thought too. Comments from panelists? I generally, you know, the more specific FERC can be in the settlements or in uh, articulating what a good compliance plan is or the do's and don'ts, I think uh, the better for the industry as a whole. I doubt if it's possible with a fraud-based system that all the various rules can be laid out uh, so specifically that you know precisely what you can do and what you can't do. I think there's going to always be some room for subjective judgment, but the more clarity that FERC, CFTC, other agencies can provide, I, it's whether it's in settlement documents, regulations, pronouncements by uh, the chairman and commissioner in presentations, the more uh, specificity, the better. Go ahead. So, just a thought. You know, the, the idea of settlement-based enforcement, I get. And if, as long as the standard against which fraud is being measured stays constant over time, ultimately people will get enough of a clue as to the behavior that's illegal and hopefully the behavior that's legal as well. The big concern, and actually Roy Shanker used the term center creep. I think that's actually a pretty, pretty good term, is that if we see enforcement become more stringent over time, remember, we have to be concerned as traders about what we're doing today being viewed five years from now through the lens of one of these brilliant people at FERC. And maybe five years from now, that might be viewed as manipulative. If that's the case, I'm thinking about that trade no longer from the standpoint of, am I going to make money on it? I'm thinking, my gosh, is this going to be something that subsequently can get me in trouble? That increases the uncertainty, that widens the compliance gap. And that's a problem. All right, please join me in thanking the panel. Great job, guys. John, come on up here. Um, before we close this event um, with comments from John, uh, I'd just like to take a moment to ask you to help me thank the organizers of this event, who worked very hard on it. Uh, Marsha Mintz, who's the managing director of the center, uh, Heidi Bishop, Kathy Bellew, Marianne Gray, and Ellen Kennedy. Could you guys please stand up and we'll say thank you to you? <laughs> if you're in here. Marianne's, sta Marianne's standing in the back already. Okay, it's my pleasure to, a to get some closing comments. And you guys can just stay there for a second. Um, from John Mayo, the, the director of the center. He, he's professor of economics, business, and public policy of the McDonough School. He's the executive director of this center which he founded in 2002. Um, he's held a number of senior administrative positions here at Georgetown, including the dean of the McDonough School. Um, and for that, we have him to thank, um, not only for letting us be here today, but for actually building this very beautiful building and this very beautiful space. And uh, we thank you for that, John, among other things. He's also taught at UC Berkeley and Stanford, and he's the author of numerous book chapters and books, including a text that some of us might be a little bit interested in called, uh, let's see, Government and Business, the Economics of Antitrust and Regulation. So, Professor Mayo, close us out. So, it, this, is, this is terrific because you just heard an introduction that's going to be longer than my speech. I am standing between you and a reception and, and I really don't want to be here for very long. You've got a reception, a book signing, and an opportunity to mingle, which is really very valuable and very important. Let me, and Peter was very gracious in thanking the organizers. Let me echo that. Uh, these things don't happen by accident. 
But let me, let me just offer one simple observation, and that is just one group that didn't get thanked, and that was you. Uh, I, we've been doing this for 30 years, uh, where we pull together academics and industry practitioners and policymakers. And we think this is just a marvelous, marvelous recipe for bringing people together uh, to discuss issues that lie at the nexus of business and public policy. Something very, very special happens when this w special mix of people get in the room together. It makes the academics stronger. It makes the industry practitioners better. And it makes policy sharper. And so for that, we just can't thank you enough. I couldn't be here at the first of this conference because I was doing a talk for a bunch of alums. Uh, our job, in part, is to, to keep our alumni loyal and giving money so we can have events like this. And then when I saw, came back here and saw the people that were on our, uh, on our agenda, uh, I'm not sure there aren't more alums in this room than there were downtown. So thank you. A special thanks to all the alums, including Bill and others from Georgetown. So uh, I hope you had a good day. And please be uh, uh, sure to keep an eye out for our future events. Come back and see us. Thank you very much.